So today what we're going to do is we're going to begin studying invention. And you're going to see why we start with practicing canons before we practice invention. But as usual, I would like to actually do our 10 minute warm up today. Are there any questions about anything that we've studied? So we're putting the canon to rest. Are we all good? All right. So I'm gonna set the timer for 10 minutes and you can write a canon of any design you so please. Set my timer for 10 minutes. All right. How did that go for everyone? You guys feel like you're getting better? Yes, a bit. Good. So helpful to do timed exercises. And it also keeps you from always trying to write high quality music, right to your lowest standard. Just get it on the page. You can worry about it being good later. If there aren't any questions about how to write canons, we'll go ahead and get started with invention. So what do you guys know about inventions? Bach's pieces. Okay, that's good. Unless they, there are other composers who have composed, I don't know. Many good ideas. Something connects all these pieces. I don't know why, what, but it seems that uh, it has something substantial hiding. Okay. Yeah, cool. Let's talk about the academic context of inventions. So back then, you would not, they studied mathematics and science and everything, but unlike today, they also had a huge emphasis on this topic that we call rhetoric. And rhetoric is the art of oratory and persuasion. It goes, it goes back all the way to Mesopotamia, and it was really flushed out by the Greeks. Thank you, Ioannis. Uh, somebody like Bach would have had to study various rhetoricians throughout his life. We know that he had books on rhetoric. The connection between music and rhetoric was profound. Uh, this is what people would learn about back then, and people would make that connection incorporate into their works. The history of rhetoric goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, but we're going to actually start with the Romans. We're going to start with a rhetorician named Cicero, and he created what were called the five canons of rhetoric. And these are invention, disposition, style, memory, delivery. These are the five canons of rhetoric. So invention is the creation of an idea. Disposition is the arrangement and placement of that idea. Style is style, it's the eloquence, it's the appropriateness, it's reading the room and knowing how to deliver it. Memory is where you internalize that idea and you understand it. And then you have delivery, the performance of an idea. And under invention, we have something called heuristic methods. Now, a heuristic method is just a practical way to get a result. It's not accurate, doesn't represent anything very important, but it helps us get started. It helps get the ball rolling. Uh, in science, we can think of this as trial and error and various kinds of informed estimates. Pierre, can you name something in your room? Can I name something in my room? Yes, name an object in your room. <laughs> the table. Table, okay. And... Juan, can you name a social virtue or a, a moral moral position, like justice or love, something like that? Sure. Um, compassionate. Compassionate. Okay. Ioannis, can you name a world problem? Environmental crisis. The environmental crisis. Okay. A heuristic method is I just asked you guys to name all these things, and I would put them together and try to make an argument or a debate about it. Juan talked about compassion. Pierre talked about a table, and Iwanis talked about the environmental crisis. We're going to try and make something up here. Tables represent to me learning and compassion. And I think a really important part of the environmental crisis is education and how other students in the world do not have access to the appropriate tools to have a good education in other countries. And so we have to be compassionate to provide them with the tools to learn about the environment so they can also participate in fixing these things and provide them these tools. And we can talk about this and how students, the disproportionate distribution of uh, resources in education also cause certain people to suffer more from the environmental crisis than others do. That's just a heuristic method, right? I just asked you guys to name something and I tried to connect things. 
wasn't easy, <laughs> but that's how you do it. All right, just a just a approximation. Within invention, we also have something called topo, which are just topics. In debate, they have various topics. It's like a it's like a word bank of topics. It's things like justice versus or, or a great a great debate is security versus privacy. That's a really big one. After 9-11, you know, do, do we want our spy agencies to be able to see everything on our phone? Is that important? Is that not important? Is our privacy more important than our security? So that's heuristic methods and top board. Now, disposition is the arrangement of invention. Now, you have to be careful. Disposition is not form, but disposition is just simply the presentation of the invention in a certain order of things. And so what we usually begin with is the exordium, which is the presentation of ideas. And then there are a couple other ones in rhetoric that we don't need to worry about. There are the, there's different kinds of forensic approaches that we have to address. We have to tell the story of what happened. We have to lay out the refutation of things, debate things. But we're going to just uh, sidestep that. We're going to say that after the exordium, we have the telon. Telon means spider web. So we have the exordium, and then we have the spider web. Uh, the threading of ideas. This is the body of the work. We have the phoenix, which is the conclusion of things. That's pretty much all it is to this position as far as we're concerned in music. And then we have style, which is the way in which you deliver things. Eloquence. You want to be able to say things in a way that is appropriate for the room. So if you are in a court proceeding, you would not say, howdy, my honor, how do you do? You know, you would, you would speak very formally, but you would not walk up to your friend and say, my honorable friend, how goes today? You know, you, you have to be able to read the room and speak properly. And that's what style is all about. It's also introducing ideas that are appropriate. So sometimes people will write their music and it'll be in a certain style and then they'll introduce a completely new idea that is completely irrelevant and out of place. So style is about appropriateness and reading the room and understanding how things should be delivered. Now, memory. Memory is very interesting. So there's a famous story. There were two godlike people, or maybe it was a god and a king or two kings. They were asking each other, what are your major contributions to society? One of them answered that I created the writing system. The other guy pointed out that, well, what you have done is you have created a receipt for recollection, but not memory. You have ruined memory. Therefore, your people no longer understand the concepts that they are studying. So memory is not a receipt for recollection. It doesn't mean that you can just spit out random facts, you know, just trivial things. Memory actually means to understand and understand on such a deep level that you can recollect it with immense freedom. You can improvise upon your recollection and that, in fact, you can understand something that you can not fully recollect something, but you can spin out the conclusion of something. So that is what memory is all about. Also, the um, there's an ancient Greek text, um, actually ancient Roman text, that says that memory is the treasury of invention. The idea here is that the more things you memorize, the easier it is to invent things. That invention does not come out of a vacuum. If you memorize more things, you, you are able to invent them more easily. So you must memorize the works of others. And then you have delivery, which is you have to perform it. You got to do a good job. Sorry, just 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 one thing. The the story that you told mm -hmm. is actually from, from Plato's uh, Phaedra. Oh, okay. The 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 Phaedro. I don't I don't know how you say it in English. And it is a conversation between the king of Egypt, Thamus, and another king of Thebas, I think, who's called whose name is Theus. And that is, it's here. So I'll, I'll just I'll just send it on the chat. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. We'll check all that out. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So are there any questions on the five canons of rhetoric? All right. Invention, disposition, style, memory, and delivery. Again, um, you said disposition is not form, but the order of the ideas. Just this. And uh, could yes. you elaborate on that on the differences? Yeah. This is. Oh, uh, you are asking for a can of worms here, buddy. I was hoping I could avoid it, but you asked. So I will answer. One thing that you need to understand, there are these two categories that we have in music. One is called procedure, and another is called form. Procedures are things like the fugue. The fugue is not a form, it is a procedure. Things like the canon. The canon is not a form, it is a procedure. Things like theme and variations, all right? Theme and variations are not 
forms, they are procedures. All right, so a procedure is just as the name suggests, a process that we submit musical material to. Now, form, it's difficult to define form, but we can say it's the arrangement of ideas according to certain principles. And so we can think of same things like the sonata or the aria or the concerto. And you can integrate these things. You can have, uh, or, or the rondo. Um, for example, there are amazing fugal rondos by Haydn. There are amazing fugal sonatas by Mozart. Uh, no, I'm actually thinking of uh, the Magic Flute Overture. That's an overture, which is like a sonata form, but truncated. Um, there's an amazing canonic sonata by Bach. And there's different themes and variations that we can use. So that's the difference between procedure and form. <laughs> what we have to understand is that sometimes in music, content, when we are just dealing with procedure, entirely controls the form. What we call this is disposition, pretty much. But when we start integrating form, it is content is influenced and influences form. They are working with each other, all right? So they're influencing each other. And disposition also plays a part in this. Now, we're not studying form in this club, although I would love to one day. What we're doing, today, what we're doing is just the mere arrangement of content according to certain principles of disposition, but we are not studying form. We are only studying procedure. That reminds me that I would love to actually show you a wonderful quote. Let me go ahead and pull it up. Thus, rhetoricians divided form and content, not to place content above form, but to highlight the interdependence of language, meaning, argument, and ornament, thought, and its expression. It means that linguistic forms are not merely instrumental, but fundamental, not only to persuasion, but to thought itself. The division is highly problematic since thought and ideas have been prioritized over language since at least the time of Plato in the West. Indeed, language is a fundamentally social contingent creature, subject to change and development in the ways of metaphysical absolutes or not. For rhetoricians, to, for rhetoricians to insist that words and their expressions are on par with the ideals and ideas of abstract philosophy has put rhetoric at odds with religion, philosophy, and science at times. Nevertheless, rhetoric requires attending to the contingencies and contexts of specific moments in time in the dynamics of human belief and interaction within those settings. This rhetorical orientation of social and temporal conditions can be understood better with respect to the three encompassing terms within rhetoric that are fundamental to rhetorical view of the world, kairos, audience, and decorum. And so this is a really profound quote that's talking about how form influences thought itself. I'm digressing now. But do you guys know the history of poetic forms like A, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, and all these things in rhyme? Can anybody guess where those things come from? Do they come from speech? The written language came into being after the spoken language existed for thousands of years. So we didn't have the written language. So everything had to be passed on through memory. And so poet, poetic verses, rhymes, meters, all that actually stems from memory devices. Remember that memory is not only just about recollecting something. It's also about understanding something. So they came up with these devices so that you could better understand what is being said. When something rhymes and what is put into a parallel structure and proportioned well, we understand it immediately much better. So when people say that content is entirely dictated, well, when, they, when people say that form is entirely dictated by content, they truly don't understand how to communicate well, nor do they actually understand how the human mind works. And so that's where all these things come from. Yes, Juan? In linguistics, I mean, even if it, like, this is something that uh, linguistics and um, semiotics study, but like, if you have the same, like two sentences that basically have the same words in it, so basically the same content, I mean, the rearrangement of the words, which is, you know, belongs to syntax and only syntax, that already changes the emphasis and the meaning of something, which mm -hmm. kind of like uh, points out that, you know, even with unchanging content, you can modify the meaning uh, only and purely through syntax and structure. Yeah, it's so all, all these things are in, integrated with parallelism and form and order and everything like that. And all that has to do with how it sits in the mind. That was a very long winded answer to your question about uh, disposition and form, Ioannis, but I, I don't know if it's clear now what the difference is. It's clear. Good. Yeah, I love form. I love teaching about form. I love studying form. It's it's my real passion. I like it more than counterpoint. 
and I would love to teach it one day. These are the five canons of rhetoric, Ciceronian rhetoric. If there are any questions, I'm going to show you one additional thing now. We're going to cover all these things. Four categories of change, also known as rhetorical operations. In rhetoric, they have these categories of change. They're things like omission, duplication, imitation, all of these things. They have these four categories of change. What we're going to deal with today are just the musical equivalents. Duplication, which is the duplication of material, a subcategory of which is imitation, imitation. And that is the duplication of material between two or more voices. That is imitation. Next, we have transposition. We understand what that means to transpose it up and down. We have mutation, which is where you change musical material. You can do it tonally, and you can do it in other kinds of ways. Um, there's tonal mutations that we'll talk about soon. There is transformation. Transformation includes inversion, so when you do something upside down or inversio, augmentation, diminution, and retrograde. So those are the four categories of change. Duplication, transposition, mutation, and transformation. Transformation includes inversion, augmentation, diminution, and retrograde. And we'll be looking at examples of this very soon. Let's write an invention. To start with an invention, we must invent a subject. And let's take a heuristic method. I'm going to say, I'm going to go from here to there. I'll do it in two, four. These are my guide pitches. These are my wireframe. Remember how we did this with the canon? We had this wireframe. So I have this heuristic method, this prompt, right? And I'm going to come up with a piece using this. This is a heuristic method that I used. I just said I'm going to go from G up to D, down to B, and I got my subject. And I'm going to say, this is A. And then I'm going to do this idea of duplication. So duplication, and this is going to be imitation. So now I have duplicated the subject at the bottom down. This is duplication. Now this forms my exordium. This is my exordium. Right? This is my statement of my material. Now notice when we did the canonic process, how we copied the material out. So we know for a fact that what Bach and some composers used to do is they used to just write the subject out and sometimes they would leave the other voices completely unwritten. They would say, all right, you can improvise the rest around it. So the only absolute certainty that you have is your subject. So write with your subjects, copy that out. Don't try to write the other material at the same time. Don't try to write the material and figure out how to fit the subject into it. Write the music around the subject. That is how you should do these things. So I have done this like a canon. Sorry, could you please repeat? You said our absolutely absolute certainty is a subject, then the connection was low. Can you please repeat? Yeah, so what we absolutely know for certain is that composers back then, the way that they would write these things is sometimes they would copy out the subject and not write the free voices. They would always write the subject ahead of time. And sometimes, sometimes they would do it at the same time but they never wrote the material and then the subject. They always wrote the subject and then the free material. This is where we see the value of the canonic process, where we're copying things out and we know what our parameters are when we write the free counterpoint. So now I'm going to begin my tell-on. So I'm going to copy this subject out. I'm gonna do something like the circle of fits. So here is, I've begun my subject. Now I'm going to mutate it. So now I have done a mutation. This is the symbol I use for mutation, the tilde sign. It means not the same. Now I'm going from one to four, and then I'm going to go to seven, go to three, and this is mutation again. So I've changed the contour of the subject. It is also transposition. I'm not doing any transformation yet. I'm going to continue. Notice how I'm writing with the subject ahead of time. And that's where I'm at. So I started to tell them, and I found my way to five. So this is five or five. Can somebody play that? Since I don't have uh, access to a keyboard anymore, Juan wants to play it. That's all there is to it. Now we'll, we'll get into more advanced concepts. The exordium, the transformation, uh, not the transformations, but the rhetorical operations, the duplications, the mutations, the transpositions, the exordium, the telum. The, the third measure of the right hand is a transposition or a mutation or both? The third measure of the right hand? Well, let's see. Well, this one, because it begins on the same, I would not say that this is a transposition. I would actually say this is something, well, you can say that this is a mutation because this goes up a fifth, and this goes up a sixth. 
Now, do we define that as transposition or mutation? Maybe it's the same. But as long as you understand what's going on, that's fine. And this isn't imitation, this is just duplication. And then we have transposition after that with mutations. So see how I mutated the subject, make it fit in the scheme of my telom. The other thing that's really important, and this is worth noting, is that the mutation is almost always consistent. If you're going to mutate something, you should do it very consistently. I broke it right here, so I'll do as I say, not as I do. But that's that's the idea. I'm not going to get too in detail about these things today. I'm going to save it for next time. So next time, what we're going to do is we're actually going to skip to the disposition, and we're going to talk about different types of exordiums, more advanced and different types of exordiums that we can talk about. Invention, we just have that heuristic process. And then we'll also flush out when we get to the telom, how to use these rhetorical operations a little bit more. And then we'll do the finis and then uh, you grab a beer and go home. That's it. But do you guys feel comfortable to write an invention in 10 minutes? Just like a can. Bring it on. Bring it on. Good, good. Trust me when I say that with practice, these will be like cannons and you can do it in 10 minutes. You can do them in about 15 minutes, absolutely. And remember to always copy out the subject, write with the subject. Don't try to write things at the same time. Copy, paste, think about the canon. I set my timer for 10 minutes. Set my timer for 10 minutes. All right, there goes the timer. How was that? Any questions? I think I came out with a good team, but I didn't have time to write the counterpoint. Oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Hey, you know, if you just copied out the theme and you didn't write out the, uh, the accompanying voices, that's totally fine. In fact, I should have had you guys just do that right now instead of write the accompanying voices. Thank you. Why I teach the club. <laughs> Any questions about that? We have the exordium. All right, Juan, can you play the exordium real quick? Yes. The presentation of the ideas, the first two measures. And then we have the telom, which leads to a cadence in three. We can see that there's a mutation going on here. Actually, this part is upside down. So half of it is upside down. And this makes it work over the circle of bits. And then we have the affirmation three. And then we start to go to four. And that's how it works. And we have the duplication and imitation. All good? Well, All good. That's Mm -hmm. um, would we say that um, the bare minimum is two iterations and uh, after that our odiation dictates our um, is there a rule of thumb to dictate the number of uh, pleasant uh, uh, repeats do you yeah. understand yeah there is no rule of thumb per se what you should know is that generally Generally, there is a sequence, um, but not always. It doesn't have to be. The sequence does not 
It helps introduce the new accidental. We'll get more into this in more detail in a few weeks. It helps introduce a new accidental, but doesn't necessarily help you modulate. So you can introduce a new accidental, but you can still sound like you're in the home key. If you want to sound like you've actually gone to a new place, you have to break the sequence. You have to reach something condensal, right? So here we have the sequence one, four, seven, three, then we go to six, but now here's where the sequence starts to break. Seven, this is where I would say we're in B flat land now. This is four, five, right? And then I do a deceptive cadence, six, and then I do a quick like turn around at the very end. I go four, five, one. So that's how I do it. And you're leading to a cadence. So you don't want to think I'm going to, sequences are very dangerous because students have a habit of thinking, oh, I got the sequence to work. I'm going to just wind it up and I'm going to let it chatter off the table. Um, you actually have to manage it and you have to see it through to the end and you have to do something with it to deliver the new cadence. I'm sorry, there's no rule of thumb about how many you can do. It, it varies. Um, it's up to your taste and your style and your intuition. Yes, thank you. That's all I'm here for. Any other questions? Here is Ioannis's. Can I ask something? Is it okay that I uh, enter uh, added alterations in the uh, in retrograde that the Dukes didn't have, so to say? Yeah, yeah. Why not? I mean, this is so. This is a canon in Cancrezons. This is a retrograde canon. Okay. I think it's. I think it's fine. I can see other people would, you know, reprimand you for that, but you know, it's. I'm not gonna. I'm, there's no rule against it. This is great. I love the linear use of it. I love this expansion that happens halfway through, you know, this kind of feature. This is wonderful, wonderful composition there and how the, the bass goes up and comes down. That's really nicely done. This is a uh, very successful work. The only thing I would caution against actually is this behavior of parallel octaves that you are outlining structurally. You can, you can try to avoid them, but you might want to, you know, uh, it's worth avoiding those kinds of things, all right? Yes. Didn't even notice, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, and then it continues actually. So this, if we think of this E as held, it even continues over to here. And then it really breaks after that, which is good. I have just one question about um, what you say, the five like points of rhetoric, you, you mentioned memory. It's good so you can draw upon, as, as you say something like the treasury. I think I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah, memory yeah. is the treasury of invention. Yes. I was thinking um, because I, I mean, I can sort of uh, think of of patterns that you could use from your background, from what you've been playing, you've been listening to. But is there any more conscious that you can do, uh, like to expand your battle streaks, so as to um, how to plan your your invention harmonically? I mean, what chords you're going to use and what functions are, or not functions, but as you, I mean, I seen your your invention. You say, okay, I go now uh, do a chain of fifth. Then when I arrive at six, I say, okay, this is the new four. And is there any any way you can consciously, you know, design your your invention? Certainly. Well, we we are going to get more into that with the telom, but let's say that that we can just take let's a heuristic method. All right. And let's say that instead of doing this, I'm going to say my heuristic method is I'm going to do something using the circle of fifths. Cool. And now can you harmonize it with the circle of fifths here? Like that? Yep, like that. Um, and now something like that. 
yeah, you can do something like that. <clears throat> so here, my heuristic method, or at least box was, this is this is the final fugue of Walter de Clavier number two. He just says, I'm going to take the circle fist, I'm going to turn it into a subject, all right? Or you can say, I'm going to take this contour, I'm going to go one, five, one, and turn that into a subject. So there's all these different kinds of approaches, and they're heuristic. They're not necessarily absolute, but they're just practical. And you can absolutely plan your entire piece ahead of time. You can go, I'm going to go one, five, one, five, and this is going to be my ingredient. Then you can say, I'm going to do one, four, seven, three, six, but I'm going to change that. Let's say I'm in minor, go to major. So this is four, five, deceptive cadence, and then quick turnaround, two, five, one. All right, you can absolutely plan all these things out ahead of time. So yeah, and I think it's worth practicing and doing that on occasion. Does that answer your question, Pablo? I don't know if I understood your question totally, but I tried. Well, yes, certainly. Uh, I, I was thinking maybe it's actually homework for us to check on what Bach will probably do with his inventions to get beyond the circle of faith and yes, just yeah. see. Yeah. I was thinking maybe to use, to, to make wireframes out of his pieces and write different material on top of his. Uh... Ah, uh -huh. well, guess what? Guess what I got for you? I've got some goodies that I'm going to show you next week, but I'll show you right now. And this, this wireframe needs to be redone, but these are models. Here's the Bach invention highlighted in red with all the, uh, all the things and everything's going to be done properly. But here's the wireframe down below. You got it down there and that's your wireframe. So you can do a model off of this. And then there's even more, there's duplexes. So there's going to be two subjects at one time, blue and red, blue and red. And so you can use all these things and they're going to be used as kind of things to facilitate. And it has a Roman numeral analysis and the uh, functional analysis. So I got you covered, Pablo. That's what I'm here for. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yes, a glimpse into the future. Okay. Yeah, but uh, this elementary invention, the duplex, is something you wrote yourself. This duplex? Show, it's something you wrote to, to exemplify your method. I, I don't fully grasp the idea. This this duplex right here? Yes. Uh, you mean it's, it's, a, it's a new invention based on the same material now? Oh, uh, no, no, I, I wrote this um, just as a, as a pedagogical thing. I don't always use box works because, you know, they're, they're irregular, they're not square, and so they're not always pedagogical. So sometimes I have to write them myself. But this is, this is something to demonstrate different ideas. But we'll get to that. We'll get to this again later. Any other questions? Let's take a look at wands. To go back to what I, my question was, I think that I, I've seen already this, a couple of answers in that I see more or less, because today we are dealing with minor mostly, the plan is a bit to the relative major, and then in Juan's case, you go to the key of the fifth degree. So that's already a plan for how to, yes. to build your, your whole invention. I mean, now you are the, on the fifth, you go back to the, to the one, I believe. I know. That's... Yes, I think minor keys modulate sooner to the third and then to the fifth, and major keys modulate directly to the to the fifth because the third is not the relative. So in minor modes, just going through the relatives, it seems like you know like a logical progression. I mean, Bach does that quite a bit, but um, in his first in invention, for example. He modulates directly to the, the fifth degree, but in some minor inventions, like the second one, which is, I think, Erickson, is that actually the last one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do si do re mi sol la sol fa. Yeah, that that one modulates sooner. Modulates to. Um, 
E flat major first and then to G minor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it goes to G minor in kind of a strange way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Generally, we'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to the tell -om, but what this is all about are the closely related keys. And so closely related are keys that are just one accidental away. So let's say that we're in G major. The other keys that are one accidental away are D major and C major and the relative minors. So we have G major and E minor. We have D major and B minor. And we have C major and A minor. Those are the closely related keys. And that's generally how the telloms are laid out. They, they just go to the closely related keys, one accidental way. You either add an accidental or you take it away. And that's the idea. And oftentimes minor will go directly to the relative major, or it can go directly to the fifth. Even in some cases, we have them going to the seventh. It's very strange. Any other questions about that concept before we go back to wands? Well, I think one, this is a very successful piece convention. I like how what typically tight this this figure eight that you have going on is, is very useful. Great for, makes for great rhetoric counterpoint and has great direction. So do you have any advice, questions, anything that you want to say about this? Does anybody have it for one as well? I think the comment would be that something that gives some, some vitality to the counterpoint might be that it starts on a rest and that is kind of like doesn't the, the theme doesn't have a head. And so you can actually play like play with that, just like filling in with the other voice. But mm -hmm. then, you know, when, when you were talking first about mutation and since that is already like, a, like how, how do you call it? Like a, a rhetoric process. I mean, it appears so often and I think we use it very lightheartedly. Like, you know, like we're mutating the theme all the time, like in order to like fit a sequence or something like that. But I wonder, you know, when, like, if that is a resource that you're already making use of, when it's legit to do so. Like, for example, all my themes, uh, all, all, all the iterations of the theme are mutated because otherwise it doesn't fit. Does that mean that the subject is not that good? Does that mean that, you know, is, is that something legit? Like, my, my subject goes down a fourth here and then right down a fifth, which I think is something pretty common since this is the um, dominant and it's like kind of a pedal. But then, then everything goes down a sixth, which has never happened, right? I mean, it sounds kind of in the style, but it is yeah. something, it's, you know, it's already a mutation and I don't know if it's justified. Yeah, yeah, well, you're bringing up an important part an important, an important danger that happens. So first, you're you're talking about a really important principle, and that is is that you want to come up with a subject that you don't always have to concede doesn't work, right? You don't want to say that this is not a good subject, so therefore it does not work. Whenever you have mutations, if you do so inconsistently in a poor way, you're often a mutation is a great way to threaten this concession that your your invention does not work. So that, that, that is an important concern that you're bringing up. However, if your mutations are consistent, I think they are justified if it is elegantly done. You know, if you have, you know, if you have a mutation that is just like a minute change, but you make that minute change all the time, then I think it's very elegant. And we can look at an example of this, actually. Here yes, is... For example, if you, if you were to do always the same kind of, like, yeah, in this one, he goes... So here, the muta actually, Juan, can you just play the opening three bars, the exordium? The opening, how many bars? Four bars? Uh, six bars, six bars. Okay. Okay. Cool. So that is the presentation of the subject in the exordium. But now look at what he does here. If he had just written this, can you just go ahead and play that? So here we have a mutation. Fa, re, mi, fa. So we have that leap of a third. That isn't there in the original, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if he had only done that once and then he had done like a different mutation or something like that after that, I would say that he conceded that his subject does not work well. 
that would be very inelegant. But he is consistent with the mutation. In fact, he is consistent with each throughout, this, this throughout well, within each, um, I guess we can call them episodes before we get to the proper terminology, which is interludio or interludium. He's consistent within each transitory space. So, fa, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, si, la, so, fa, mi, re. So he has that leap of the third. And then here, he doesn't have it. But here in this one, here he changes it. This is actually the inversion of it. And this one is a leap of a sixth instead of a leap of a seventh, like here. So here, he does a leap of a sixth. But you might think, oh, well, he's not consistent with the leap of a third. Well, he has, he has it organized that he's always consistent within each block of transition. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can say that this block is going to have this kind of mutation and this block is going to have that kind of mutation. So it is very organized and it is very clean. And I think that's why these mutations are very justified. Here, he doesn't have a leap of a sixth. He has a leap of a fifth. But he is consistent about it. So in this block, it's always the same. You know, then it continues on. So, do you want to do you want to try playing? Go from the beginning and just play up to the relative major. And so I think your mutations, just a principle of mutation is that you should be consistent about it and you should be organized about it. And you should be organized along the terms of, you know, the disposition and how you're going to do this kind of mutation consistently in this section. You're going to do this kind of mutation consistently in that section. You're going to be really clean and organized about it. So as long as your mutations are organized and consistent, I think they're fine. I don't think that they're concessions that your subject doesn't work. Unless... You know, it's like a principle of variation. For variations to work, you can only mutate it so far that you still recognize the subject. You know, yeah, you, so as long as your subject is recognizable, that's fine. So yeah, that is, that's my advice about that. Thank you. Ioannis sent a invention as well, an invention. Awesome job. Ioannis, do you have anything that you want to say about this process for you first? Um, yes, I realize how important it is to audiate because now as it was played, I it was very obvious the cross relation in the third measure between uh, F uh, sharp in the bass and F natural. But when composing, um, I had the ambiguity in the... Um, you know, I was anxious about uh, how should I stretch the sequence or if it was legit to add the accidental B natural to the cadence in the fifth measure or if it was uh, uh, premature, such yeah. things. Yeah. Much more easier when I was just thinking for the subject and then feeling the counterpoint. Yeah, it's that canonic process. That would actually um, both resolve the correct relationship and also um, just make it breathe a little bit better, I think. Just in the sequence, um, shoot the third eighth note <laughs> of the right hand. I mean, that's that's a that's something that I do a lot um, with my yeah that one. Yeah, so. I think it breathes a little bit better. It is elevated, totally different. <laughs> yeah. This is, this might be craziness. But the other thing is, <clears throat> what is striking about this orally? So, what's the mistake here actually is that that is an unprepared dissonance, right? And you're doing it, you can keep, kind of think of it like an appoggiatura, right? But what if you did this and you just 
embraced that cross relationship. You prepared each dissonance. So when you do, when you have secondary dominance, you can actually create false uh, cross relationships with leading tones quite all right. Juan, can you try playing that? Yeah. From Can you do it one more time? Just so we can hear. Like that? Yep. Yeah. Let's 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 be uh, let's be jerks and let's let's even do this. Create these false relationships. You'll you'll see actually it creates a lot of nice complexity in the harmony. False relationships, they have to be used carefully, but you can do them really well. So that false relation actually is totally acceptable there because the theory behind it is, and you know, actually probably I'm sure you have, and, and Juan, you guys probably are really familiar with this, but if we are in, in G minor and we have a dominant chord like this, let's say that we have a dominant flat nine. Juan, can you play that? Good stuff. We can't double that leading tone. Right, you can't double that E uh, F sharp. Right, you're not allowed to do that. However, if you want, you can just suspend the E flat by doing this. This is totally acceptable. Can you play that one? That is that is acceptable. We have that all the time in Mozart. We hear it in occasion in Bach. That's that's the cross between the harmonic and the uh, between the melodic minor in rock. They call this the Hendrix chord. Yeah, alter dominant. Yes, uh, they consider that to be an augmented nine for some reason. They're they're totally wrong about that. <laughs> That's one of the things where they are absolutely wrong that it's an augmented nine. I've I've seen that logic before. They're totally wrong about it. They yeah, it's like the resolution is downwards. So the resolution is downwards. I, yeah, the, the, you have to hear it that way too. There's no other like you don't have a choice. It's it's in your biology. That's that's how you hear it. So when they when they say it's a sharp ninth, they're just they don't they don't understand their own ears. It's absolutely a flat nine. You know, you have this cross relationship. I mean, I would just analyze this as flat nine with the flat, you know, the suspension there. But yeah, when you have something like this, it's totally it's totally cool to prepare this because what you have over here, you have that ninth, and then you're also resolving it down properly. You have that cross relation, but you're also resolving it down properly. And the other thing that I thought was interesting here, which is something that I think more people need to talk about, was that you resolved the leading tone up to the third. Not a lot of people talk about that resolution. I, there's no name for it. I call it like an extended resolution. I, it's like when four goes down to one and seven goes up to three. Those things sound totally fine to me. If you play this, Juan, can you play that? Just going from here to that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds totally okay with me. In fact, we could even go further. We can do this. That sounds totally resolved, at least to my ear, because this has gone up to there and that has gone down. That's and they're obeying their tendencies. That sounds very resolved to me. Um, and so this resolution that you did of seven up to three right there, I think is cool. It would be more typical to actually have a perfect authentic cadence there, so the D would be a B flat. It's more typical because you have a perfect authentic cadence at the modulation, but yeah, it's just one thing. Any questions about that, Ioannis? And now I was just uh, observing that um, after the fifth measure, uh, fa, fa, uh, the resolution of the bass, um, is it okay? It is a bit extreme. You're talking about that? Yes, and this low fa is uh, F2. 
uh, so to call it, uh -huh. is a resolute, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's totally fine. At least I, I think it's fine. You're just exaggerating the, the cadence. Of course, this is, you know, what I, what I think actually makes it fine is that you outline this range, this large range, and then you fill it in with a nice contour at the end. I think that's really nice to justify. That's, that's how I think about it. It's almost like the, the upper fa is the one resolving on the B flat on, at the beginning of the um, sixth measure. And the other one would resolve an octave lower when that line goes down to meet that other B flat. Yeah. It's like a little bit of delayed gratification. Yeah. Even here, which would be like a deceptive resolution of the fa, because here you're, I'm guessing. It was the purpose. But if I had one comment, is that I was coming uh, along with these ideas where I felt somewhere there that I had to plan a little bit. When I created the subject, I should have in mind that I, I would talk about, uh, talk, yes, uh, I, I felt that I needed a bit plan planning beforehand when I wrote the subject, the first two measures, the exordium. Hmm. Well, it's always important to have a plan. I mean, back then they had plans. They they had the plan of other pieces that they knew. There was a template that they all followed. So that's worth having a plan. Have a plan. All right. Tim also sent one. Check out Tim's. Great. I like the subject. It's, it's a full bar subject. Uh, it's more typically tight. And it's fruitful. It gave you a lot of good material. And you took things to the dominant, which is great. But right to the dominant. You didn't go to the relative major, which is totally fine. That happens. So cool. Do you have any questions or comments that you want to share, Tim? Yes, my, maybe just how to continue. So what, what would you do after where we just stopped? What would you do after yeah. this? Right, because you, you, you kind of laid out, out the plan for the beginning in, in a very precise way. Mm -hmm. This is something that we'll cover when we get to more teloms in the future. Pretty much your teloms is going to go from one. And let's say that you went to five. All right, and to get to the dominant, you introduce a sharp or, you know, natural. And then let's say that you want to go to four. You're going to the closely related keys. To get to four, you have to go through one. Or you can skip there, but let's just say you can go through one, and then you get to four. So you introduce a natural, you can go to four, introduce a flat. Let's say that you go to relative major, it's a natural, and then you go back to one. And then uh, that's it. You do a perfect authentic cadence, and that's the end of the piece. It's whatever you want it to be. The ordering of keys is totally up to you. All you got to do is get a perfect authentic cadence for whatever keys you want, get back to one. And then that's it, you're home. Okay. Peace. So basically you just repeat the process. Yep, you just repeat the process. Cool, thanks. Yep, very simple. These things, they, uh, they didn't complicate it too much for themselves back then. This is excellent. It's very similar to Wands actually, because you guys both have this. This is this, this kind of half step figure eight. So yeah, that came out great. Any questions or comments for Tim? Uh, no, thanks. Great job. We got one more at Eduardo's. I can play it if you don't understand my handwriting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Nice improvised ending. Very nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what's interesting here actually is that you played a dotted quarter note and then an eighth G. 
But I actually like what you wrote here a little bit more, actually. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more stately and just delivers it changes. Actually, would you mind if I have Juan play just so we can see it along with the score? Yeah, sure. All right, Juan. Um, the the Hemiola is re really beautiful. Yeah. That's, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and the pro improvised ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this is this is beautiful, and I love as uh, Juan pointed out the theme is Actually, here Eduardo played a dotted quarter yeah. note with a G sharp eighth note. Oh, I'm not sure which one. I'm not sure which one I like more, but I kind of like this one that he wrote. Dun, da, 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 da. I mean, that's, yeah. that's and it's, it's Himiola. So, da, 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 da. You know, that's great. And I think the virtue of this one is that it's actually very dance-like. And so one thing that we haven't talked about much in this club is the integration with other styles, dance styles, singing styles, instrumental styles. But this one is very, it just twirls very nicely and it's it's very dancey. So I think that's I think that's a virtue of this one. I think it's very successful with the Mignola. And you ended it. You have this, you actually have a perfect authentic cadence in one in the sixth bar, which is cool. That's totally fine. Sometimes Bach does that. And that's the type of exordium that we're going to talk about next week. Next week we're going to cover all these different types of exordiums that you can do. Yeah, cool. Do you have any questions, Eduardo? Well, I think what is difficult is to know where to end the sequence. Because you have a lot of options, right? You can modulate, you can keep on the, the tonic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think yeah. it's just taking a decision and and sticking to it. Yeah, yeah. You have you have to have a repertory of sequences memorized. You have to know what they did in the music. And you have to call upon whichever one you want in the moment. But there is no magic formula. There is no certain way you have to do things. So it's just you have to make a decision and go with it. So yeah, it's absolutely true. Hey, you should finish this one. Yeah, I will try. Yeah. Thanks any for part? your feedback. Yeah, of course. Thank you for providing it. Any uh, any questions or comments for Eduardo? All good? If there aren't any other inventions, that is it for today. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. You're welcome. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.